So good morning. We're here at Downtown Golf in Stanford with uh, Paul Perrone and a couple of housekeeping things before we get started here. Uh, I want to thank Caitlin, who's at the section office, taking care of everything back there. And then uh, Noah Rosenthal, who's here filming everything. And uh, just to give you some updates, on Thursday, the 23rd of February, we're going to have Marty Jertsen from Ping Golf. Marty's the Vice President of Performance and Bidding. And so Ping has uh, some new apps that they're introducing. But did you get the new apps? I did, yeah. So they got some new fitting apps that they're uh, very excited about introducing. And then uh, looking forward, uh, 25th of April is our educational summit at Trump Ferry Point with our host professional, Brian Kroll. And Jane Seekman is going to be doing short game. And Bernie Najar is uh, going to do some full swing and how he uses force plates and creating speed with his players. Uh, and we're going to do this outside. It's the, it's the first time we've been outside. So, you know, we wanted to try to get late into April so that we could do it then. They have great facilities down there. So, so hopefully it comes off and we get good weather. And if not, that's my fault because I helped pick the date. So I'll take full responsibility for the bad weather. But if it's 80 degrees, I'm also taking that responsibility. So Paul Perone is the owner and operator. Paul, as you well know, is a, is a member in good standing with the with the section has been at the club professional level and uh, has owned his own shop for what, how many years now? Well, since 2007. Nine, all right, so 15 years. And uh, I utilize Paul a lot of times for my clients to get good fittings for, you know, one of the things I'm always concerned about is are my clubs fitted properly for my clients? And since I know next to nothing about proper fitting, I always send them here. And, and Paul does a really good job with that. So. Uh, Paul's done a number of seminars in the past, and so we thought it'd be kind of cool to do a, a workshop seminar for all of those who have your own shops, you know, your, your golf shops. Uh, club repair is a added revenue and, and can be, you know, a rather, rather good revenue if you know how to go about it. So we want to take you through some of the things that, that you can do here in your shop and also some of the things that you shouldn't try to do in your shop because of, you know, some of them are a little more uh, detailed, sophisticated, and Sometimes it's good to call in a professional. So, Bob, we're going to let you take us through what you do here. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think the best thing to start with is kind of give you an idea of what you should have in your shop. So, um, let, let's start with um, let's start with so we'll start right here. So, I have I have two shaft pullers. Um, the reason I have two is this one broke once. And it really slowed up the operation because I didn't have another one. So I got this Mitchell one here. This might have been about 250 bucks. And let me tell you, that's all I really need. This thing here might have been 2,000 bucks, but it's got every bell and whistle that you can have on it. And we'll, we'll take some shafts apart. If anybody wants me to do a project, just tell me because I'll, I'll do it. All right, we'll, we'll make something. I'll try and make a lot of clubs. I'll show you how to take stuff apart with this. I'll show you how to epoxy some stuff together. I'll take you through some grips. Um, so just whatever you want me to do, I'll, I'll, I'll do. Then another thing that you're gonna need is something to measure clubs with. So sort of give yourself a standard. Um, you know, if you can maybe show the guys this over here. I made this, um, I made this device here. So it's got a scale on it. And it slides along here. And, uh, you know, I can go to the length I want. And then I can cut with it once I turn the wheel on it. And so you'll need a cutting wheel as, as well. And then I hooked up a fan to this. Uh, there's a vacuum system that's down in the basement. And that will collect all the dust that's come through here. This also comes off. I can move it to a standing belt and then I can move it over here and collect smoke and so forth and anything I don't want to want to breathe in. So that's how I set that area up. Um, I have a frequency analyzer, which I rarely use, but I have a frequency syrup analyzer. I would also suggest you have a scale. Um, it's a good habit to get into weighing club heads and seeing what you're working with there so you can deal with swing weights later. You'll need a swing weight scale. 
which I have up here. I will get into that further. Um, all right. Let's say we take some stuff apart. How's that sound, Joe? Yeah, why not? Just jump into it. Put yeah, your little chef's bib on. So I'm putting my really smock on here. So to take a, an iron apart, I'll start with this one here. I have, I'm gonna use this as a vice as well. So I'll plant the club in there. This is a, uh, a tool called an easy club, and this works by induction. And all you have to do, if you don't want your shop running down, you would put this on the golf club. There's no flame. So that's heating it? This will heat it. It's very hot. We'll do less smoke this way too. And then that club will remove. Quick. It's quick. You know, I, I use a torch a lot. You could use a heat gun. Again, a heat gun, you have less chance of burning your shop down. This thing, less chance of burning your shop down. So however you want to do that. So now to put a club together, since we have this one apart, you're going to need to clean this and you're going to need to clear this so there will be a bond. So I'm just going to stand this down real quick. <laughs> Why not? We have glasses on doing it. Um, there's a piece in here, so there's a swing weight in here that has to be removed. So again, we would heat it. So with the proper tools, all this goes a lot faster, doesn't it? Yeah. Again, a torch or a heat gun will work, but really is good. This this thing here works. Works great for steel. You can't use it for graphite. And it's nice because there's no flame. It's nice because there's no flame. So you can't leave it on. You know, the torch, this torch at least, it's easy to walk away from that and leave it on. So I've done it. I burnt anything down yet. So, so this would be, you know, it's removed. And if you look through it, it's still a clog in there. So we're going to drill it out and clear that. That's the only way the epoxy is going to bind. It broke. Well, that's clear. Now you'll take the head. And then we'll, we'll clear that out. It's clean. Let's run this drill through here. And that should be pretty clean. So you're going to leave marks on the outside of the head. Scotch bright. Perfect. And then this will be reset back in here. So as far as epoxy goes, I use DP810 3F. It bonds quickly, stays pretty hard. Little dabble, do you? Very important to keep it refrigerated when not in use. This club with this epoxy would be dry. We say in five minutes. So 
that's that. That club is reset. We're on to the next job. All right, pretty easy. Um, another job that I see a lot of, that I get repairs on, is when a shaft is broken inside the hosel. So let's make one like that. We'll do that. Do that. Anybody have any questions, Chad? No, no questions, Chad. I think the easy way to do this is just to show guys how to do it. If there's a better way, John, tell me what to do. I'm going to cut this. Like I said, I have a I have a fan set up here. Well, see a lot of pieces, a lot of shafts that are broken like this. So it's it's not as hard to repair as you think. Um, this has to be obviously heated. And then what we're gonna put in there is an extractor. So I have some, Home Depot has this. We'll find the size which you're gonna use. You're gonna tap it in there. You pull it right out. So do that. Another good thing to have is shaft pads. Put those in your vise. Yeah, easy club that works so well. So Paul, would it be a good idea to take your old old shafts, old clubs, you know, clubs that you know aren't being used anymore and teach yourself on those clubs how to do this so that you get to you know being very quick with your process? Um, yeah, so your demo clubs, a lot of these are all demo clubs that I have. Um, they're, they're, it's okay to make a mistake with them, right? We don't necessarily care what happens to them. This, um, yeah, this is just an old, an old iron I have from the fitting for me. So it's going to be there. Something stuck in there. It doesn't always go smoothly. You never know what you're going to find a lot of times. If you're taking a ping iron apart, I would tell you pings pop. So when you're heating it like that, it's going to pop. So you're always going to turn this away from you. Normally, I have a, a fan set up here. And uh, I just don't say it's going to be too noisy. Clear that out so nothing's backing it up. So the box is just not melted enough. Right. I'm only not heating it up just to keep the smoke out. And then sometimes it'll pop right up. And there's the pop. Right. That's all done. Had that not come out that way, we would have just twisted this out, pulled it out. And then we're cleaning this out again. 
This is just a, essentially a piping bar. And that's prepped for the next thing you want to do. So anytime you're putting new shafts in or or fixing you know, repairing a shaft, that's nice revenue for the shop. Yeah, oh yeah. And, and you know, everybody wants it right away, as you know. So um I think the faster you can do it, uh, the more you can charge for it. But honestly. All right, so let's get into pulling some uh, tips. So hosels, OEM adapters. Here's an old tailor-made adapter. So this adapter has a separate piece here. So there's no way to save this piece. You can still buy this piece. Um, you're just not going to save it. So knowing you're going to ruin it, you might still need the shaft or something. So now this wouldn't work. So now I've got to use heat for this with the blowtorch. Yeah, that plastic piece I'm going to melt. So mounting into a shaft puller like this, and believe me, this thing will pay for itself in no time. Just gonna load on it. So that that handle you're pulling on is a hydraulic. This is hydraulic. This one isn't. This one's manual. But like I said, this is this is all I need. This other one is only So again, that piece is it's all if you do it properly, the graphite shaft, it really isn't even warm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so soft and tough. So you've saved this shaft, you can use this shaft again. Like I said, for the most part, this tip is ruined, but this, you know, I have this piece, so you can get this piece again. All right, so there's one shaft you can save. I need it for, for something. Um, I'm probably gonna bounce around a lot, but as I think of stuff, I'll throw it out there. As I inventory shafts, I'm gonna inventory them for the most part by weight. So I've got your 40 gram, 50 gram, 60 gram, 80 gram, 90 gram iron shafts, and then I'll start getting to 105. I'll keep them in order of company. Um, then I'll get to wood shafts, inexpensive iron shafts, Inexpensive wood shafts, very expensive, very expensive. So it, it scatters about, but to find them easily, it's all by weight. And that's how I would organize them, it's all by weight. The ones you see up here, those are all pulls. Okay, I'll use those for repairs at times. Um, and I'll try and reuse everything. I mean, I'm a saver of things. Well, it's nice to have because you're adding to your inventory all the time without any cost to you. Yeah. And so then that's. Again, found revenue. These 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 here are all brand new. These these wedge shafts. I have a million of these wedge shafts. So you have them all organized and categorized. Yeah, I can I can find them very easily. Like I said, to look at it, you wouldn't know, but these are all organized very easily to find. Okay. So a question, Paul, was that I struggle with getting the epoxy completely removed from the shaft in a timely manner. How do you get the build up epoxy off the perimeter where the bore and bottom meet? So I assume. They're talking about in here, okay, where the board, oh, where the board and bottom meet. So down at the bottom here. So, yeah. so to, to drill it, um, if you start with a smaller drill bit, okay, so drill a little pilot hole and then gradually go larger, uh, that's how you'll get deeper and get to the bottom. Many times at the bottom, there's going to be a weight. So the board depth is usually looking a little over an inch. For an iron head, if it's less than that, there's a good chance the club's going to break. Uh, you have to get that weight out. So you may find that you have to continually heat it uh, to get that weight out so you have the, the proper depth. So, so you're so again using good. your blowtorch to heat it? So you use your blowtorch to heat it, and that piece, it will pop out. So, so, so always work that away from it. So right. you're going to direct it. Normally, I'll direct something like that down right towards the garbage there. And that, that piece, once it gets under pressure, it wants to go. It comes out quickly. It'll come out quickly. Uh, the number of times when I've been up here watching you repair shafts, I'm always surprised that the stuff 
that you find inside a shaft from your major OEMs? Uh, yeah, so it'll be interesting to, you know, sometimes you'll see epoxy um, go way down the shaft. So you'll see epoxy, you know, going going this far down. And it's, it's hard to clear all that out if you're going to use that shaft and install it again. So, you know, I, I have drill bits that are longer that can reach down there. Um, it, it's also a good idea to have a ramrod which you can insert through the back of the plug and ram that piece out that way. A very good tool to have. John brought a putter in today, which is gonna be hard to um, get the shaft out. And how I'm gonna remove that shaft is I'm gonna remove it uh, down, the, down the hosel. So I'm gonna go in, I'm not gonna heat the head, I'm gonna heat it from the inside I'm going to heat this rod. I'm going to insert the rod down here and heat it from the inside out so I don't damage the plug head. It'll take a lot longer, but now I can afford it. And so you're setting me up for, setting you up for extreme cost on my end. Good. At least I know going forward. So one of the ways that you can save your putter heads and not damage them, nick them, or burn them is to work from in. So you're removing your pop and your grip off of the Any club, not just the butter head. Right. So you're going to work from the inside where no one's going to see the scratch. Correct. Nice. I like that. It, it's easy to burn a head. An iron head, you know, this is the one I just took off before. You can you can see there's marks here. Um, so the Scotch Bright pad um, will we'll clean all that off. If you use a very fine steel wall, That'll clean all that off. A lot of times when people are getting club repairs, I don't think they understand the level of expertise because they're not watching it done. Well, it, it also, when you know, when you do so many of them, it, it you know, this club is done. So this is the one we started already glued. It's right. glued, it's ready. Um, if we have to turn the ferrule down, it's ready for the next day. If we have to cut it, we have to grip it, we can do the rest of the work on this. It, it goes so fast when you know how to do it, um, it doesn't look like you can charge a lot. You know, you're only, only taking five minutes to do it. But it's the expertise. Right. All right, so let's, let's discount the, the price. So we got the price of the shaft. Right. Right, which could be anywhere from steel shaft to irons wholesale. 25. Okay. 25 pieces. 25 piece. Dynamic bolts, somewhere around 25 a piece. All right. And so now you got the price of the shaft, and then obviously you have your time. Can you give us a reasonable parameter of on top of that 25? You obviously got the time, you have to probably regrip it, you have to take the tape off the grip and so forth. What's a reasonable range of what I can charge one of my members for a reshaft? I, I would say that that repair you're looking at, um, it, it would be probably $55 plus the grip. It's probably where I would see it priced. So you're making, um, I assume you're making $10 a grip. Right. And then I would always double, a little more than double my money. Yeah. Uh, and then if I came in to you at five o'clock on a Friday night and wanted it right away, obviously I'm going to pay a little more to have it done. But usually, usually the person at five o'clock that understands it. So if you're at a private club then and somebody comes in with a broken shaft after the round of play, but they're going to play Saturday morning. You might come in at the turn. Yeah, so you know, you with, with epoxy like this, that dries this quickly. If he comes in at the turn with a broken club and you have the time to do it, then I would probably put this under heat. So I just have a regular heater over here. I put this under heat. That thing is ready to go. He could have it by the 11th hole. So you're going to use the heat to set the epoxy. That, right, that would set the epoxy. Good idea. And that, that would make it, I mean, it's only five minutes under the heat. And um, that would probably be ready to hit. It's ready to go. No, no problem. No problem. Very good. Thank you. Um, I, I wrote some other stuff down here. So let's see what I have here. So as far as equipment goes, we haven't turned this around. I have a feral turner back there. Um, it, was, it, it just looked like this. And uh, we'll, we'll turn some ferrules down. Um, there's obviously a grip station, which I'm sure everybody has, and everybody's comfortable with the, the station they have and the way they use it. 
as far as taking grips off, let's 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 take a grip off. And um, the reason I'm showing you this is because I had a professional in the section once come in. He had a he had a set of wind grips to do, and he said to me, oh, "I got to go back to the shop and I gotta do a set of wind grips. It's going to take forever." And I said, "Why?" And he says, "Oh, they're so hard to get off." And I said, "Well, show me how you're taking it off." So he he stripped it he, he stripped it once and i said no you gotta strip it twice so when you strip it in two different directions the grip peels off as easy as it as easy as it does so i'm in the habit of always stripping grips twice every one and that's how i get that grip off and again it's just something he didn't know how to do um tape removal so again i would use this thing on a steel shaft this thing is a blast. And that's how I would get all the tape off. Well, faster than using a utility knife and stripping forever, and then you got to clean it with. It's, well, this would be so much cleaner, too, right, than yeah, using a right. utility knife. The blowtorch, you know, you could certainly use that in graphite. I would be using a blowtorch. And um, again, this is this grip would be ready to go. As far as saving grips goes, I'll show you two ways I'll save grips. So here is a uh, here is a shaft with no head on it. There is no epoxy in this end, so now I can't shoot an air hose through here and blow it out because there's nothing to do. The air will just go out, so it won't create the back pressure, you need to pop that off. So I would always just roll it back here first. Okay, and then you may have to move this over here a little bit, Noah. So then I use this tool here. Insert it this way. If I had to save a grip, like I had to save, I'd do it this way. As opposed to using air. Here sometimes you'll pop the grip, so I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot the air or shoot the solvent in here and gradually push this down. I'm gonna tell you most every time I'll save that I'll save that grip that easy. You're not gonna see this at Harvard Business School. No, no, no. But um, can we just make five bucks? So that's that's how I go about saving grips and stripping grips. I don't know if you noticed the way I held the knife. So many times I see a guy holding a knife like this, I strip on the club up here. You got to work that knife down and away from you. You got to um, you got to grip it this way. You can't hold it this way. This is a sure way to get tendonitis. You get it like this, you get all the leverage. That's it for a regrip for a re. Um, and I would think, you know, taking grips off is definitely something that the assistant professional should be doing. Um, yep, I would say that that is an easy job for the assistants to do. Plus, they need to learn how. They, they need to learn how. It's, it's again, it's you're going to make $10 a grip, or you should be making $10 a grip. And um, if you can save that many grips, you know that's that to me is a big profit center. I have um I have a putter grip I have to put on over there. So why don't I why don't I show guys it's a long putter grip I'm putting on for somebody. So I'm gonna get in here. And you may have to turn it this way. I'm gonna mount it here. So this is my my station here. So this grip being a little longer presents a little more difficulty. So you're measuring the length of the grip? Yeah. Save yourself some tape. Save myself some tape. Save yourself some time. Some time. And then you always have a little bit of tape shoved down the shaft. Yep. And then I'll, I'll even, I'll even cap it off here. So this grip here is it's a little bit of a challenge. 
you got to get it a little, you got to get it good and greased up because you're going so far with it. I use Brampton's like everybody else, I'm sure. So as I get this started, I'm just going to shoot over there. When you shoot it with air, you're expanding the size of the grip. Right. It's it's I don't think expanding the size of the grip so much, but you're you're getting again that back pressure that you create and that gets the solvent running down the uh, down the length of the shaft very easily. So having it wet enough allows me to still turn it and square it here. And I would say having Compressor makes that job a lot easier. Again, something not too expensive to have a compressor. It'll pay for itself in no time when you figure how many grips you can save in reusing it. Right. You know, if somebody wants a new grip on a on a wedge, and you already you pop it off in a second. Plus, you it's a time. Time saves all the time. Right. Yeah. I mean, a, a longer grip. You know, to to work work it all the way down there. It's a a pain in the neck, especially if it gets stuck, it's easy to back out and do again. Right. Okay, what else we got? Let's just talk a little bit about grip inventory. All right. All right, because obviously somebody comes in, so you got to have a basic inventory of grips, and especially if if your members know that you can grip overnight, so to speak, right? You can grip them at the end of the day and have them ready for them the next morning. They bring them in late Friday afternoon. They want to play Saturday. They expect you to have it. No, I, I would say you're going to have at least 15 of everything. For 15. Start. 15 of, you know, so you can at least always do a full set. Now, you, you know you're going to sell the most multi-compounds. You know you're going to sell poor velvets. Whatever you know you're going to sell the most of, those might be the ones you get a case of. All right. right? Um, Plus, if you buy them now, they're never going to be, they're never going to be any less expensive. Uh, right. But, you know, it depends on what plan you're on, obviously. But um, so I get my grips from Golf Max, Jack Jolly. I get 10% off their price, no matter how many I order. Right. So I, I think with uh, some accounts, you have to order at least 100 or w whatever it is. But that's nothing when you're going into a season. Right. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like to buy a case of grip at a time. It's a lot of money, so it gets to be kind of expensive to order a case of grips. A case of multi-compound grips at ten bucks a piece. You're spending fifteen hundred dollars and throwing them on the on the wall. So I'll keep fifty usually of most every grip around. Right. I have a ton of putter grips. So I love having a lot of putter grips, so people have choices for putter grips. I'll charge more, more for putter grips too, for that reason, because I have a lot of choices. But I'll keep a lot of putter grips. Around. And putter grips typically are going to be more costly. Putter grips are usually more costly. You know, I, I think it, they're harder for people to put on square. So many times I'll look at somebody's putter grip and it's crooked. Um, a lot of times I can take that off and straighten it. Again, that would be a cost to somebody. I'll still charge somebody $10 to straighten out the putter grip and they'll say, oh, well, that's a lot straighter. Or to change a putter grip, I would always be at least $25. To do that. So oftentimes when, when I've been around and people bring in putters and the first thing you always do is you look at how the grip's put on. Yeah. And, and oftentimes, oftentimes you... I'll check the loft of that putter too. So okay. the loft of that putter, if it's off, it could be the, the, the hosel's bent or the shaft's bent. Um, there's a number of reasons why that could be. So sometimes it's a question of changing the loft to get the putter grip square. And people are often surprised to note the putter grip was not on square when you point that out to them. Oh, sure. Especially when they get it right from the manufacturer. So I like to get the putters without grips. It's it's harder to get them with. It's harder to get them that way it seems. But I like to get them without the grips so I can put them on. Correctly. And I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many times I'm taking a double bend shaft and taking them apart because when that's crooked, the putter face doesn't sit doesn't sit so flat. So the shaft itself is perfect. The shaft is crooked. So a lot of times I'll have to take that putter apart to get it to sit square. Otherwise I'm sending. Which becomes too much work. I just rather just pop it out and just right. redo it and, and do it yourself. 
what about the idea of uh, like especially if you're at a club like you have a lot of old demo putters or you know old lost and found putters and no one's playing you could always put a series of grips on those to have those available so somebody could take it out to the putty green rather than just hand them a, a putter grip without a, a shaft and a head in it right so they could well they could you know, demo that putter grip so i would you could blow any any putter grip onto a club and have somebody try all right. So that wouldn't be permanent. All right. So just to cap off, um, just to cap off the end of almost any shaft uh, with tape, put a little solvent on it. You can blow any grip on it, and then let him take it. So if he doesn't want it, boom, just, just take blow it him off, off. And, and no harm done. No harm no, done. Nothing, right? nothing would happen. Can you that. cap it off because that way it's not going to cut the grip. The cap it slides on easier, so you right. can put a little solvent on there so you can slide it. Off. So you're gonna blow it on with air, and you're gonna blow it off with air, come off. And that's a good way to get somebody to try to try to get the grips. And then if you want to promote the, the putter grips, you could always put a little little standout on your putting green with those putters with different grips on for people to try, couldn't you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 A lot of guys but do I've been chumming, fishing. chumming the waters. Yeah, when you go fishing. Rob, Rob Sutton was knows all about that. Let's see what else we got. Um let's see. Oh, I have um I use I use this tool for grip sizing. So I use this, I have calipers too, which I'll use as well for um for getting grips to all come out the same. So as you probably all know, butt diameters on different shafts are different. Uh, especially if you look into your wedges and they always come out smaller. That's because the butt diameter, again, as most of you know, is smaller. The grip comes out smaller, so you have to build that up a lot of times to get the same size as everything else. Um, to use this would be a good gauge uh, off the other irons in the in the set to get to the proper size. So everything feels the same. Easy thing to do. Um, not much cost. Easy thing to sell your members, I think, too. Um, to go in there and say, hey, your grip sizes are all wrong. It's very convincing for somebody to sit there and go, oh, you're right, this is a lot smaller. Well, you can show them how you can make them all the same size. And, uh, kind of an easy sale. But sizing, so I keep room, uh, compressor. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, visit the loft and lime machine. How's that sound, John? Why not? All right, so it's right over there now, so I'm gonna come in behind you. All right. All right, so obviously we're in a small shop and Noah's been very good about moving us around so that we could see what's going on. So we have a, uh, I use a Mitchell Loft and Line machine, it's good for lefties and righties. Um, Do you think Mitchell makes the best product out there? And as far as the cost of it goes, we're getting quality. Mechanics has a good one, um, but as, as far as like, this is sort of a, a industry standard, I guess you'd say. And then you have it bolted to the floor with four bolts. This is bolted to the floor, so it's not going to move anytime soon. This isn't moving. You could make a. Um, I would make a portable one. I'd make a portable base. I would probably put it on wheels, and then I could roll it right out to the driving range. And I would, I would do it right out there first. So we've often talked about the loft line machine as probably one of your best investments because there's no more inventory needed. All it takes is people power from this point on. And, and I think it would be a good idea if you, if you had this in your shop, you could go through their clubs before springtime and before you open and just let them know the condition of their clubs. Because obviously, as we all know, from usage, be they on mats, which a lot of clubs are for a period of time, you know, especially early in the season, or some clubs totally on mats, you're getting a lot of bending of of that sure. eye angle, aren't you? Yeah. Throughout the season. I would also say too, from the manufacturer, they don't always come the way you order them. So if you're ordering them two degrees up, many times they come standard or they're not very consistent. So you've got to check every so time you get a set in. You're going to check through every set and, and make sure that. Um, uh, they align with what you fitted somebody for. The, uh, you know, if anybody has one or uses one, but 
this machine here is, it is so easy to use. Now you can see loft, you can see loft and lie. You're going to change loft stronger this way, weaker this way, or upright this way, flatter this way. Um, I have a number of different bending bars, but this one would be probably most suited for this club. So once that's anchored in there, there's a clamp that goes in the back, which I'm going to spare us of setting it in for our purposes here. But once we measure this angle, we're going to bend it, put pressure on it this way. So you're going to bend the angle down? I'm making the club flatter. So now I'm at that's 61 degrees. So if I want it to be at 64, we're going to go more upright and see how close that can What do you think your range is from low to high is how much you can bend these without snapping it? Um, well, I picked an easy club to use. I picked a forge club. So of, this course easy. of course you did. Um, but, you know, you, you usually have two degrees up and two degrees flat, or maybe three degrees flat. You can go with most clubs. And as I'm going to inventory clubs, usually I'll inventory them two degrees upright because it's easier to bend flatter. I can, I can go easier back down the standard very easily. I usually don't have to go more than three or four degrees upright. So and if you bend that, let's say you take it from, let's just say you take a, a sand wedge and you bend it a little flatter, which you know a lot of us like to play a little flatter mm -hmm. sand wedges for a variety of shots. Is that going to affect the loft at all? Um, it would if I wasn't bending on this loft. And then we would still be able to check it. So this club started at whatever changes I made to it here. I haven't changed it. It's still 34 degrees like it was. And if I'm going stronger, um, this way, now I'm yeah. All right, so you just took some loft off of it. Made it stronger and then to go weaker. I, I usually wouldn't go more than two degrees, uh, although I many times go look at that, but I usually don't go more than two degrees because then you start changing the, you know, the sole of the club lot. So as you go stronger, you're going to move, you're gonna you're gonna remove the bounce. As you go stronger, as you go weaker, you're gonna increase the bounce. Good so to know on wedges. Good, good to know on wedges. I think as a as a tour player likes to look at a wedge, he wants to see it with less offset. So you might see him take a 54 degree wedge and make it a degree um, weaker. So he gets rid of some of the offset. He increases the bounce. Now he's sitting at 5410, he's got a 5411, as opposed to taking a 56 and bending it stronger. All right. Because he's gonna add he's gonna add offset, doesn't want to see it. All right. So you got to be careful, especially with your wedges. Like I said, if you're going two degrees, um, a lot of people won't notice. A lot of people won't notice that. Um, but it's something to consider. And it, it may be a way to decide how somebody, you know, is getting 54 degree, 56 degree. 58 degrees, 60 degrees. All right, and as long as we're on the idea of wedges here, what do you see when people come in as far as how well do wedges fit people? In, 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 in other words, you know, are people properly fitted for their wedges or, you know, they're just buying them off the rack? Gapping's hard, okay? And, and to get gapping right, it's not a question of just looking at a 45 degree pitching wedge and saying, um, oh, the next one has to be 50. If you look at how much spin that 45 degree wedge is producing, so if it's producing 9,000 RPMs, once you figure out what you want the next club to be, to be a 10 yard gap, maybe that's 9,500 RPMs. Now, if you pick out a wedge that's only producing 8,500 RPMs at a 55, it's gonna be a different yardage, you're gonna have right gap. All right. And that used to be a bigger problem with wedges. Uh, as CGs changed, you'd get different spin rates from 54 to 58. Uh, I know Bokey works very hard on that, trying to get those CGs the same throughout the, the wedge series that they have here in 50, 54, 58, tries to keep the CG the same so the spin rates are progressive. Remember some of the older wedges, you, you'd sell a guy at 54, you'd have to make the 58, 56 to get it to go the right distance because it was going too short. We've often talked about when we we're fitting wedges, like if you and I were out there fitting wedges with my students and, and your ability to fit, would always do it out around a, a, a chipping pitching green where we had the bunkers, where we had the heavy grass, where we had the tight grass. Yes. Um, 
because in addition to lie angle, you're looking at bounce, right? And also how the player is going to use it. Right. You know, is he, is, you know, is he setting the club square? Is he opening the face? You always want to see how he's, how he's going to use that to see how he's going to engage the bounce. Right, because a lot of times when you're fitting, you end up teaching in here, don't you? Uh, you have no you know, way around it. Yeah, you're right. You know, he's 12 degrees outside in with a four degree downward attack with his driver. It, it's going to take a long time to to go through some drivers. So you've got to um, uh, you've got to you've got to make a change. You got to make a change in that player's setup. You've got to affect the data quickly. Right. As I say, you got you got to you got to affect it quickly, and you've got to show him change. Once you see his shot, you know, okay, I hit it 210. Okay, well, once you see his 210, what's his 210 look like? Is it 3,500 RPM? Is it, is it, you know, is it low? Is it high? What's his ball speed relative to his club speed? And then, you, you know, you, okay, well, I know this driver does this. I know this driver does that. So as you said before, you know, I'll, I'll pick a, a lot of times the way I'm going to choose a, um, a particular driver head is going to be on how the hosel works. So how that particular company's hosel, you know, a tailor-made hosel is going to turn the club face left or right a lot. Well, if I've got to affect face angle quickly, I might, I might want to start with that club instead of one of the other clubs I have because of the way their hosel works. Because there's a lot of magic to fitting. Well, there's a lot of magic to fitting. Yeah. Say, I have found that some of the best fitters that I have, have been in contact with and communicated with over the years are also good players and have a very good knowledge of teaching. But it seems like all three of those kind of interact when you're fitting. So, you know, you're, you're a good ball striker, you're a good player, you're a good fitter, and you also do instruction here at, at your, your shop. So that's a nice little segue. Let me say, say one more thing too, is you know, knowing how to build a golf club helps that too. So knowing that you, uh, you know, knowing certain shafts, you can't make one inch short because you'll never get the club to balance properly. That's an interesting point. So, Kirk so, Gregory talks about that a lot of times. Right. You know, because Kirk is a is a club build, oh, builder, sure. okay. and that and then everything else worked off of that. So that makes that makes somebody like Kirk very knowledgeable about what he's doing, and and obviously you you have that same ability to to to, to know how to to build. A, you know, years ago. As club fittings evolved a little bit and puzzle, I used to take the heads apart, rebore face angles, knowing that I had to close the face for that player three, four degrees. So I would rebore different heads and then insert a shaft shim in a different direction, knowing that now through impact, this club face was going to be two or three degrees more closed than it was before on his six, seven degree outward path. So I was getting the club face closer to square relative to how he swung it. That's the way I did it then. And then it's, it's just evolved. So it's kind of uncommon to do that now. But and we made some, and we, I remember we made some hybrids for you once where yes. we flattened them um, because it, you couldn't bend it in its present state. Right. The hosel didn't work. So we reboard that hosel and flattened it out. And, you know, it made it harder to hit left. Still that idea from Bobby Hines. <laughs> no one enjoyed those think, more than Bobby. I think he still uses it. Yeah. Still. Bobby knew what worked. So um, let's see what else. I see some questions here, John. What do you got here? What was the name of the main tool you use for heating shafts? Not the torch or the heat gun. That's uh, uh, called Easy Club. Easy Club. Easy Club. Yes. So, Is that the ramrod? Uh, Is it talking about this tool here? Uh, to heat the name of the main tool you use for heating shaft, not the torch. Uh, that was the heat gun. Must be the ramrod that you put on. Maybe. I'm sorry about the ramrod. I mean this. Is the... The ramrod. Yeah, Jeff, if, if, are you talking about the ramrod? If you would just put your put your answer in there, so I know. And then, um, so Rob Gable works over at Metropolis with Craig. Mm -hmm. He says we do regroup them, but hesitate to reshaft. 
we have a ton of lawyers. It might be a liability if we mess up the epoxy and the head flies off. Is there a valid concern or do we need some kind of liability insurance? That's a good question. I have a liability insurance for it. So um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I just know that I have one. All right. Right, so obviously, if you do it correctly, you're not going to have, obviously, you know. You know, it, 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 and then right, right, from, the, right from the manufacturer, it can come flying off. Too. Yeah, right. So, uh, you know. And then also, if those lawyers are 12 degrees out the end, there's a good chance. There's a good chance. Of it's a good chance. Right. Uh, Paul from Matt Dobbins, in your experience, where is the line? of outsourcing a repair versus doing it in-house for a generic private club. So how much expertise do I need before I realize I don't know what I don't know? Um, you, you obviously have to be comfortable with what you're going to do. You don't want to ruin the golf club, um, especially the club that's out of production and you couldn't replace. Know your strengths, know your weaknesses. Yeah. Um, you know, I've seen guys break shafts regripping clubs. So, you know, that's an easy enough job to do, and that, that should never happen. But I've seen that happen. And, you know, I've seen the shafts get that are broken be very expensive shafts. So I would say that um, you, you've got to be comfortable with, with what you're going to do. And I, you know, the, the first when I first started doing club repair, they had me take all my clubs. Right. So I had a vested interest <laughs> in making them come out correctly when I put them back together. I would say when you're starting out, I would start out with these demo clubs. I would start out with, you know, maybe fixing some juniors clubs and, you know, some, some, some old sets that it doesn't matter what happens to them. But if, if you don't have the right equipment, if you don't have a decent shaft puller, and you're talking about pulling graphite shafts, you're going to ruin them. Right. So, uh, you know, they're, 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 so it's a matter of knowing your competency levels. And obviously, you know, uh, some belt professionals like yourself. I spend a lot of time in a workshop. You spend a lot of time and you enjoy it, too. Oh, yeah. You like what you do. Oh, yeah. Right. And that obviously that's not for everybody. No. You know, so uh, it all gets down to how much experience do you have? Uh, I think you have to have the idea that I'm going to, you know, it's like technology, right? You go in there and you learn how to use it. You go in there and, you know, um, this device right here, I think is what your hand is on. What is that called? Um, so this is a shaft puller. It's, shaft puller. It's um, called the Ultimate Extractor. They don't make this anymore, but I've had this. I've had this since 2005. But there are no other, yeah, no, obviously, other shaft pulls. You know, the, the, so one, one point, this piece wore out here, and uh, I had to have a part made for it. And that's when I didn't have a shaft pull, and that's when I bought this one. And like I said, I use this for certain things, and I use this one for certain things. Like I said, a lot of times I'm using this kind of as my vice, so I have to keep pulling and pinning out, given the, the space I have. So then one of the other things that's going to determine your competency level is how big an inventory of tools do you have? To do the job right and where's your comfort level right and you know is your repair shop in your shop or is it in there's, your cart barn there's some jobs i don't want to do because i don't have the tools i don't have a drill press in here um i have a drill press but no place to put it in here All right so if i had a drill press there's other jobs i would take on and do um the jobs that i don't want to do are jobs where they take a long time so if it's going to take me an hour and a half to do a job, what am I going to charge a guy at that point? Right. You know what I mean? Is it going to be a three hundred dollar job? And you know, you just you got to factor in your time. So uh, some jobs I I'll send out to, but very few. All right, very few. One a year. All right, and so then you just got to determine who on your staff has a competency level that wants to do it and you have you have to like doing it as well. Yeah, like I said, even even with something as you know it seems as simple as grips, you'll see you'll see them, you know, you'll you'll make mistakes. Um, you know, if you're start start to use a compressor all of a sudden and you start filling the grip up too much, you stretch it out of shape, it's ruined. And again, if that's a multi-compound grip, that's a ten dollar mistake. 
how many ten dollars mistakes you want to make a year. Well, if you're the assistant professional, not a lot. But no, especially yeah. if it's the head professional's money, right? Right. Yeah, but a lot of it's it's you you learn on the go, right? You learn by doing. It. A lot of you learn by doing. Right. So it'd be kind of hard to put, you know, it'd be hard to have that experience in, until you actually start doing it. Right. So when they're this is a get your toes making mistakes. This, this is another tool that I made. This is a um, this is a crimper. A and crimper. Here, let's show this camera right here on the one. So if you look at um, here's a here's a club head that you can see it's a very loose fit. A lot of times you'll see this with tailor made club. This is a loose fit on some of the models. They just keep coming apart. Just keep coming apart. So to to put this in um, properly, or so such a, a way it won't come out. that's an equipment defect on the the OEMs end. Yeah, probably. You know, I, I don't know. Um, it, it could be the the shaft that they're getting comes the wrong diameter, just slightly off, and they just don't match up. So this is how you know when, when I see some of those clubs that I get like that, I'll use this crimper, and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna sand the club head, okay, which we can spare you know. And then the club would go in this little dimper. Down. Down. What I've done is I've made two little dimples now in the shaft to sort of expand it. And now as it goes in, it's tighter. It's tighter. So now the bond will be much better and that club will really never come. And so you've just crimped the shaft in two places to make a tighter fit. It used to be pretty standard practice. So Mizuno would have all their clothes always be dimpled that way. Um, we used to dimple everything back in the day. But now as epoxy's gotten better, it's not so necessary. But still, you see those clubs, you know, I'll that's see 20 fine. a year, 25 of those a year to warrant me having that tool. Like I said, I, I made it. So it wasn't, I never saw any, I never saw a dimple. Maybe we should trademark it. Yeah, it's not a big fault for that. Same with this thing. I thought this thing was brilliant, but I never saw anybody. Never saw anybody have one on those. But... So part of part of what you learned over the years is how to invent tools to make your job easier. Oh yeah, yep. And then you, I, I'm always looking through um, again. Golf mechanics would be a big one. Uh, golf works. Uh, going through their catalogs, you know, my friends have workshops and I like to go in and see what they're using. You know, when you spend a lot of time in the workshop, you come with a lot of tricks and to have the different tricks, uh, different places, so you speed your job up a little bit, you know, you can do more repairs. This, this workbench will be, I won't have this empty in another month, this will be full until August. There'll always be stuff in front. Clear it. If I clear it that night and have everything done the next day, I'll have I'll just it'll be just as many right in front of it. And it'll be like that going right through August. That's nice to know so what you're in for. So so you know, I'll have I guess I do work for about 17, I figured 17 different clubs will bring me clubs, and a lot of times they'll wait till they get four or five, six at a time, and they'll bring them in. It's a long ways for them to come sometimes to come here. And they'll drop them off, and you know when a club drops off their clubs, I try to get them out the next day. So you know that that could take an hour and a half to do six clubs very easily, depending on what type of repair it is. Right. And you have to have a strong enough inventory to be able to do that. And you know, it, it, some of the jobs are a little harder than others and take a little longer. But you know, I know their members want them fast. So, and I and I know that they sat there. For, you know, a few days. So too long. Yeah, again, it has to. Right. So, and then uh, Nick had a question about measuring loft and on a putter and so forth. So, what we're going to do, Nick, is uh, toward the end of the program, we're going to have to go out into the other part of the the shop here where Paul has his putter stand, and we're going to, you know, I have some questions because I like to do a lot of putting and and I like to change shafts and putters, which uh, Paul and I have been talking about for a few weeks here. So uh, we'll get into that uh, in a few minutes here. Somebody asked me to do uh, something the other day on tipping a shaft. Um, okay, so why would you tip a shaft? So 
a, a shaft would come raw like this, and this shaft would be uh, 46 inches in its raw length. Now that's not the raw playing length, but that's the raw length. The reason it comes longer is because you can cut it from this end or this end. Uh, so a butt trim shaft or a tip trim shaft. When you get a player you might feel is between an X and a stiff, you would tip trim the shaft to make it stiffer and, and sort of fit in between. So sort of like a stiff plus as opposed to an X. So depending on the shaft and what you're trying to do to it, as you cut it from this end, you're going to move the kick point up and the wall flight would get lower. You gotta be aware of that. You gotta be aware of that, knowing that. Um, and this is a high kick shaft. And then maybe knowing I'm gonna tip it, I might go to the, the, the next model, the blue one in this shaft to tip it differently, knowing if I'm gonna cut it from the stand as I'm gonna affect the characteristics of the kick. So that would just involve you cutting it from this end and then butchering it the rest of the length of the shaft. So anytime you cut it from the tip end, you're obviously going to affect the stiffness of the shaft and the kick. You're going to make it stiffer and then you would make the point up. And so you need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Now, so for the average, you know, golfer, so that's, I don't know if you're familiar with hard stepping and soft stepping a shaft, but hard stepping would be taking the four iron shaft and putting it in a three iron set. And then soft stepping, taking the four iron shaft and putting it in a five. And why would you do something like that? Again, you'd be effectively having a shaft that's tipped less or more. So you're going to, that's going to affect the performance of the golf club. Launch and stiffness, right? So you also, if you're soft stepping it, you're going to increase spin. You're going to help that ball. So it's almost getting you between stiff and regular. Soft step and then the hard step it will put you on the other end of that spectrum. So when you're fitting and you and you know how to do things like that, you can always you can affect the performance of the club for the player that can't create the spin on their own. Right. Magic in the shaft. It's a, it's a way of getting the shaft to do more of what you might. Need. Now, is would you say there's a <clears throat> a clearinghouse? You know, like if if a golf professional doesn't know how to do something club fitting wise. Is there somewhere to go to try to get some more information to figure that out? You know, like a Wikipedia for club repair? Are there sites? There's, there's different forums that you could join and look at. Sure. I couldn't tell you what those forums are, but I think it's coming from different places. So there's some social some media stuff pay, out there. Pay to follow. Right. Um, I think. Um, Uh, we were talking about putter shafts, you know, the past couple of weeks, and we're looking at putting some different shafts in a, a couple of the putters that I want to play around with. And um, we contacted the company, and they have their own fitters, and they were, then they fitters reached out to us. So a lot of times the companies themselves would be a good resource for what their products are going to do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So down at the trade show, I'm, I'll, I've met with companies to um, discuss how their products work and um, how to optimize different things and, you know, to see what the capability of it is. Does this club bend as well as that club? And that might dictate how I'm going to inventory my shop too, knowing what the different clubs are going to do. And That's why you have to, you have to hit them before you order them. Some of the companies don't really think that makes it harder to work. And what about the pandemic? All right. So you, during the pandemic, obviously there are a lot of uh, difficulties getting different parts of your inventory, like grips, you know, we had a lot of grips that were not available and so forth. What are you realizing now, uh, not only with your inventory of club repair products, but also with your OEMs? I mean, is everybody back to speed or some still lagging behind? What are you finding? Because you deal with how many different OEMs for your, your equipment? Uh, five or six. Okay, so you got five or six different club manufacturers. Some are slower than others. That you order from. So I'm still seeing some, uh, I ordered a set of irons the other day that are gonna be two months. Two months? Mm -hmm. Not good enough, so is it? 
I think that's really a big thing is to, you know, if you're ordering clubs, you, you got to understand when they're coming in because, you know, you, know, you don't want that member sitting at your doorstep every Friday afternoon. Well, with I, the UPS. You know, during the pandemic, I think the companies have gotten better at letting you know that. So, you know, TaylorMade usually lets you know right away. And if they do change it, which they do, uh, you get an email and they'll, they'll tell you, you change the dating of it. So they keep you informed. Callaway, or I'm sorry, Titleist now gives you a daily report and in your email of what's in production, what's coming. It's fantastic. I mean, the date and everything. It's a good line of communication. Yeah, with Titleist. They, yeah really, really good. Um, and then Callaway <laughs> usually will tell you as soon as you order it, this is going out in two days, three days, a week, whatever it is. So you're, you're pretty much on it. I'd say Mizuno is telling me two weeks for most orders. So they're, they're, they're better at it. it. Just the problem is it changes. Right. So sometimes so you told somebody two weeks and then all of a sudden, hey, where's my club? It's been two weeks. So they told me they changed it. They changed the day. But you said. But the more communication you have from the company, the right. more you can share that yeah, and diffuse the attitude of the customer. Right. It's, it's That's a good thing. Um, so we want to look at putters. And we do want to look at putters. Um, we have some questions about some different because I um, I'm surprised that putter shafts have not evolved more than they have. And now uh, there's a couple of putter shaft companies out there that are addressing putter shafts and, and giving you a different feel. So you know, I always found it hard to um, to show the difference how one is better than the other. So looking at, we're going to look at the BGT. Or Breakthrough shop. technology, yeah. Barney Adams. So when, when we, um, you know, I think to have that in a club is really going to be your best way to sell something. Yeah, so you have to have that demos. Yeah, demos of that <clears throat> and put them out there. And um, I said, otherwise, it's hard to sell that idea. But um, you know, people will notice a difference if it feels different. If they make more putts, it, it, it'll be an easy sell. I, I would also say right now it's an easy sell to sell a thousand dollar driver right now. You know, the aftermarket shafts, you look at um, some of them are so different. When you look at the data, they're so much straighter that it, it's very easy now to to put somebody in a four hundred dollar shaft, a six hundred dollar head, and it happens, you know, every other day. What about that pink shaft back in the corner? That one didn't make it. This one did not survive. This is a ship sticks accident here. Or um, this is the year one. This one broke. So um, speaking of expensive golf shops, yeah, yeah. so you've had some success with that company. Uh, I did. Um, you and I played with Wendy Modic and your wife last summer, and Wendy has that in her driver. Yep. And then you fit a couple of my uh, clients with that shaft in a in a Titleist set, I believe. I get the strangest feedback with that club. It's almost a love it or hate it thing. And some of my clients have said they hit it straighter than any club they've ever had. Um, some of them say they hit it further and then some of them hate it. I played with one of my clients who is not a particularly good driver of the golf ball. He came to you for a fitting. You found that shaft in the Titleist head that worked for him and if I told you how straight and how far he was hitting the ball, you wouldn't believe me. And I didn't believe him when he told me. I had to see it. And when we went out and played, I saw a driving exhibition. And he just, he loves that club. He loves that chap. And then I've had other guys that have tried it and, and can't hit it at all. Right. Just, you know, they hit snowballs into right field. So it's a hit or miss with that. It's hit or miss with it. And like I said, uh, plenty of requests for it. So it still sells. And yeah, you'll keep selling it. It seems like it's very much a tempo-driven shaft. Yeah, too. agreed. The right. quicker tempo, I don't see how the they just tempo can't. Yeah, yeah they can't manage the shaft. That's where it is. It's just too light and too flexible. You David was a slower swinger, and so he's creating a lot more club head speed with that shaft due to his tempo and the, the tightest head that you put him in. Oh my God, I got success one story, right? You won't be bringing it back. Got one right. Got one right. What else do you have there that we would be interested in? Um, from a, um, a shaft standpoint, 
so we we talked about um oh you know what i wanted to show you guys how to do so i have a um i have a bore through head so who was it matt was asking me about clubs that you Right, Matt was like, more difficulty doing. Yeah, Matt wanted to know, you know, when do we draw the line and chip it out? This yeah. might be one that you draw the line up, but you still see plenty of bore through heads come through that get broken, and obviously they're going to get broken. Is that an old Callaway? This is an old Callaway. And that was a big deal with X18. Callaway with the bore through. Bore through, very small bore depth. Um, really, this is the only area that's supporting. The shaft with a lighter weight shaft, these break all the time, hitting them off mass. So, how do you fix it? If you look at a parallel tip shaft, you go in here, does not fit. How do we get it in there? We could use a taper tip shaft. But why do we take this shoe? So I made two cuts going in two different directions. So you actually cut the shaft. Put the shaft, and then when we insert it, the shaft would go all the way in. And just like a finished shaft like this, you have the same marks that you had before. So the rest of this club to finish off, this has to be filled. Okay, so I have, and again, I might be one of the only ones to have this pin because I'm going to see this repair. This pin would fill it in. Then we're going to grind all this down and make it smooth. So that's a rather intricate if job. I didn't, I'd, I'd fill it with off. We build this up, put this in here and grind it down. That's what I'm going to do. So this is a, a more intricate job, but you know, a lot of times guys have asked me, how do you get that angle? And you don't have to cut that angle. You just grind all this down. So. You're going to put a ferrule on it, obviously. And you have a metal plate on the floor that you're tapping against? Yeah, I should probably mention that. Um, so now we'll epoxy that in there. Fill this with, like I said, that dry pin I had there. Or again, it might be a golf tee I might use if I didn't have one of those. And then grind all that down, sand it down, buff it. And um, it had the smooth finish. It would look just like you came from the factory. So that's the kind of job that gets very intricate and then you have a lot of different tools here. That, that would be a harder job. Uh, to do, but it's also a popular job. So I mean, that's that's you know you'll see a lot of those throughout the course of the year because there's so many of those heads out. People still use them, and um, guys can fix them. So I still have whipping. You know, I'll whip the shaft every once in a while. I'll get a wooden club in here where the whipping comes off. And <laughs> whipping is a lost art. <laughs> whipping is a lost art. For those of you that did not grow up in the wooden head era, it used to be when you would refinish a club, you would take the whipping off because the whipping supported the neck into the uh, in the wooden club head. And so then you'd have what, maybe four to five inches of whipping? Yeah, maybe not that much, but two inches, two solid, two inches, maybe three inches. Yeah, three inches of whipping go up the shaft with the old nylon. So you'd roll it down and then there's a special knot. So right. Yeah, you, you, you had to learn how to figure it out. You pull it through, cut it off. And um, I think the harder thing is just having the wood stock because that, that's harder to find. Collector's item. It's a collector's item. But I get one or two a year. Somebody will come up with a Ginty or something. And 
still using it. So, um, I don't think there was any golf club in the history of golf better than a Ginty. <laughs> Ginty made everybody a player from the rough. Was that like a, that was like a seven wood? I guess we had to put it in today's wood. terms, right? As, as I understand, Callaway bought that patent, and then they they remember they had the Warbird Soul plate, which looked just like a Ginty. And then that's how they, that's what they configured those clubs at, those shop trays right there. And yeah, because they had a, they had a, a sole plate that had a V shape to it and would just cut through the rough. And it was anybody who could not break 90 had at least one Ginty in their bag. One of the toughest clubs to get out of somebody's bag. You'd never get that club out of a 90 plus yeah, shooter. No. 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 They put band-aids around the whipping to keep the whipping <laughs> Who made the picture? Want to talk about pub heads flying off, Rob? Once you see a band aid around whipping, you know that club head's coming off. That'd be fodder for your attorneys over there in Metropolis. What else was I doing? So that's something that I forgot. Do you do any kind of stamping or soul grinding? And if you do, what equipment do you use? So um, soul grinding would be a lot of wedge work, right? You, can yeah. do a, you did that with some of my wedges. Yeah. So I'll um I'll use this. This grinding wheel here, and then I'll I'll, I'll take off raw uh, material here, and then finish it off by buffing with a buffing belt, and get it um, you get it shiny and smooth again. And as far as stamping goes, I have um, I have the material to do stamping. So these are again, this would be something you'd find. Um, Ranger or MSC or those companies. And these are numbers. I have letters too, but yeah, so I'd use these and a hammer. Yeah, a mallet. You, you anchor it to, to uh, uh, maybe the back of the spice is where I probably do it. Anchor it in there and then stamp them down. I'm not a big fan of it because it really decreases the value of the club and the resale of it is destroyed at that point. So I don't. Um, I don't do do it all the time, but it's uh, it, it's something you do. Yeah. Do you do so much grinding with the wedges? Yeah. I, I, every time Wendy Moda gets a new wedge, she makes me grind it. I can tell you that. Do you charge your extra for it? <laughs> well, Wendy's got a lot of money. Why won't you? Right. But there's um there's certainly I would say with with the grinding of wedges, more of it is to. Uh, to fix uh, a, a, a scratch or a dent or something. Not so much from a, I don't do so much from a playing standpoint, uh, but some guys will ask for heel relief or toe relief or shave some bounce down. And it's really a guy who's trying to save um, a wedge. Here, I want to try this with less bounce. Mm -hmm. I'm going to wedge here and then we'll we'll grind it. And say, so, okay, let's try this bounce and then we'll make it up. And then, and we've talked about this in the past, um, you find that you know with better players that they like to have little flatter lie angles on their wedges. Sure. Makes them more versatile. Don't want to hit left. Don't want to hit a wedge left. Hit left. So you're gonna hit flatter most of the time. So if you're if you're upright with the rest of the set, you're usually looking at wedges. A lot of times you're two degrees flat of where you were with everything. And so if you go two degrees flat and you take a little grind off the sole, now you've got a very versatile club around the grains. Right. But you know, there's there's a lot of grind options out there now. So yeah, there are. So you, you, like I said, you don't have to do much of it. Um, you'd rather do it with a raw head as opposed to a chrome finished head because it's going to rust out. But not everybody has that. Not everybody really cares either. No, it's more functional, isn't it? Right. So uh, as long as we're talking about, let's get into some some thoughts on wedges and fitting, right? So you obviously have different OEMs, and uh, I would think that certain OEMs wedges are are going to meet one need versus other OEMs. Or so, so, what are some of your favorite wedge companies and why? Um, because so you sell a lot of wedges. I sell a lot of wedges. Um, I would a couple say hundred wedges a year. Um, eh, close to three hundred wedges. 300 wedges a year. So with the with Vokey, I, I would say I do the most of in part because they have the most grinds. Um, I think their club feels closest to a forged 
wedge. So the bull off the face has the right sound, has the right feel. Um, for that reason, I would say is a big reason why I sell most of their wedges. Um, I do a lot of Callaway wedges. Um, they have a new one with a new raw finish that I kind of like. I'm going to address how the player is going to use that sole. I'm going to watch how he uses that sole. I'm going to measure it on the launch monitor to look at the attack angle. And from there, that's how I'm going to choose the wedge. So again, Loki's got more bounces. Um, that, that's really got a lot of reason to do more flying and do more of that. Because they have more of a selection and you have to customize it less. Right. I don't want to have to grind every wedge that goes out of here. Right. You know, if I can fit it and then have that, I'd rather do that. And are there, uh, I, in a perfect world, John, I'd be standing on the driving range or, or, or around the bunker. Or like we talked about. Right, about it, yeah. right with the grinding wheel in front of me. It's like, oh, try this, try this, try this. I think if you're at the club and have a nice practice facility. Right. right like and you, it's, it's so specific to certain Right, clubs. like you're up at some place like Glen Arbor, which I think has one of the best, you know, short game practice facilities in the section. You know, they have every shot imaginable. You know, you could have a fitting card of wedges, you know. All out, different out there, Right. Yeah. And then you're going to, obviously, you're going to find certain clubs are going to be more, uh, useful out of a bunker certain clubs are going to be more useful out of high grass you know obviously low bounce off of you know if your golf course has a lot of tight lies in front of the green then you're obviously going to sell a lot more low bounce right mm -hmm. so so making sure that your customers buying the club for the intended purpose is going to ensure their success with it isn't it absolutely right absolutely so a lot of bounce on those of you with tight fairways in and around the greens are not going to work Work. That's the right. course you're playing all the time. But you can create a lot of lessons because there's going to be a lot of skull shots. Right. All right. So know your customer, know the, know what you're fitting them for, right? Here's one from Michael Tunisia, who is old enough to remember wooden drivers, like the rest of us here. If wooden driver can be designed, built today, that would be able to work with the modern ball. The older wooden heads were designed to hit a lot of balls, and when metal woods came out, the balls had to change to be used with the metal woods. That is so true. Also, drivers today are much more upright, aren't they? Yeah. We've had that conversation a number of times about if we could design a driver and have it built. You know, if a company was willing to to flatten out the driver, right? Uh, I don't know if it's possible. It has to be possible. I don't know why Sony doesn't make a, um, a hosel that you could go four degrees flat. I don't know if it's possible, or, you know what I mean? Or four degrees, or whatever you want. Right. I don't know why um, that isn't necessarily an option. But yeah, that, that would be nice to see a, a driver sold flat at grass and then, you know, look flatter at impact. But it just doesn't seem to be what the OAM I what the OAM seems to do. I don't know the reason for it. Uh, this winter I went down to just north of Philadelphia. And there is a company down there that I found by the name of Makefield Putters. Oh, okay. And it's and I showed you that putter, right? And uh, the gentleman who founded the company is an engineer by trade, but he loves golf and just thought he could build a better putter. So he spent a couple million dollars and created a factory and you know, his milling machine, so he mills all these aluminum heads, and then he has an anodizing machine. And so they they wanted me to consider fitting their putters, and I told them that just like they had too much stuff in a fitting part of the putters. I just don't need all that stuff. And so he said, what would you do if you were me to make fitting a putter simple? I said, what I would do is I would, since you're designing everything yourself in-house, I said, I would design a putter where just like the driver, you can take the shaft out, all right? So we go through the, the sole plate, if you will, of the putter, the bottom of the putter, right? And there's a screw, there's an Allen screw. And when you take that Allen screw out, the whole hosel and everything comes with it. So now I can use one or two heads and then I can have, you know, anything from a say 67 to a 73 degree shaft to put in to try. And so then I went to the PGA show and I went over to see Makefield. And the first thing that the guy said to me is, we took your idea and did it. Look at this. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So now 
there, I can have eight or 10 shafts, right, if I want, and I can have different grips on them and use the same putter head. And so that putter head will accommodate all the shafts, which I thought was just like the smartest thing I've seen. Not because it was my idea, because now I can, well, can, I can yeah, I can have a, a simple bag of, you know, how to fit a putter. And so the what's other he, what's he gonna, is he gonna sell uh, a fitting cart or? No, you don't need a cart. Oh, you know, you just need a, a small bag of shafts because every one of those shafts is a different line. You can have different, obviously you can have different lengths ah, and different lie angles. And then, so then you can just have a fitting bag of shafts. Mm -hmm. You can screw that into the head and voila, you got the putter right there, then and there. And the thing that I was most impressed- He with, might be able to do that driver. He might be able to, and he's got enough money to, right. to be foolish enough to try that. Right. We might talk to him about that, it's a good idea. And the, uh, the thing I really liked about this company was if I order a putter this afternoon, they'll ship it either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. One day turnaround. I know I can have so I can you know I can have if I wanted to have it overnight I could have it tomorrow morning. I know it's it's the only the only powder company I've ever talked to making a custom powder make a custom powder and give me one day turnaround. So that was uh, that's kind of interesting and and they're very, very open because the guy has he's not in this for the money because I said to him you know, we went to lunch <clears throat> and I said what if you know you spent I I thought maybe. Two and a half to three million dollars to create this putter factory, and I said, "What if you don't sell any putters? You're not successful." He said, "I'm already successful." And I said, "Why is that?" He said, "I built the putter that is engineered correctly that people can use," and he said, "That was my objective. So if I don't sell any, it's, I got a putter factory. I don't care." Yeah, he wasn't in it for the money; he was in it to prove a point to himself because he's an engineer. So that was pretty cool. And I really like the idea of the removable shaft. Yeah, that's good. Because they're the first company that took the idea, because I've talked to other companies about this, but they just, that's what we do with drivers. Why couldn't you do it with other clubs, right? Yeah. That's what you do with your fitting cart. So, yeah. But they're the first company to, to fit the shaft with a Allen screw to the head. So now I can fit their putters and with very little inventory. And then what I thought I'd do is carry a number of heads, carry a number of shafts, and as soon as I sell, that then I just order one, they ship it tomorrow or today. No, no. Industry How many different head models is he? Pardon me? How many different head models does he have? He has maybe two to three in the mallet, and they're uh, they're creating some blades as well. And what was interesting is he has different ports, and when we go out to the other room, I'll I'll show the putter, but they have different ports on the back of the putter. There's three different ports. And then you, you can use, uh, he has weights, there's three weights in each of the ports. So they're uh, titanium, aluminum, and steel. So you can adjust the head weight, which perfects the, the way the putter works. So you can, you know, you can work with certain things, you know, whether you want the heel to close faster or the toe to close faster, or, or just kind of neutralize everything. Hmm. So it's a, it's a good way to fit a putter with weights in addition to, you know, length and, and lie angle. And the, like I said, you know, uh, Takes what ten seconds to take a shaft out and put another shaft in. Right, no time at all. Yeah, no time at all. Want to do some putters? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to move out to uh, to the other part of the workshop here, and so Noah's going to move the computer, and then obviously we're not going to have you the screen set up for about fifteen seconds here. See just how good Noah is. Up to this point, he's been outstanding. So we'll just check that. All right, live once again. So this would be my putter live off the machine. So this one again is a Mitchell. 
This is the intro. And you have a digital read on the back of this machine as well. Uh, yeah, this is um, this has already been calibrated, so it's ready to mount. Um, what was the question we had before on? When you're on working the with changing loft, do you want to change loft on a putter? Okay. And so, and we'll, we obviously we'll look at the line angle as well. So we'll mount this putter first. So obviously, one of the most important things here is getting that putter securely placed into that machine so it's not moving. So you have a clamp both on top of the putter and then coming in from behind it to secure it tightly. I got a few different pieces here. Sometimes I'll jerry rig it a number of different ways to get it in there. So it's the same distance apart on this size as this size. So that's how you know it's center. Sight line usually lines up with this line here. Um, so this putter is mounted pretty properly here, let's say. So to look at the loft and lie of this putter is it's, it's a 70.5 degree lie angle with two degrees of loft. Um, I have a number of different tools this would not be my favorite choice to change the loft here, but I'll use it either way. The other one is similar. I would mount it. So depending on the, the model putter and the, um, the, the hosel, might dictate how I'm going to take this off and finish it. Um, I, I'm not going to mark this putter up, so I'm not going to take this off and worry about it. But you could take an old rubber grip, cut it, and put that around there. It makes a nice clamp. You don't later, scratch it. Bruise the putter. Like I said, with this putter here, you're not going to you're not going to do any harm to it. But so then to, to mount this in here like so, this bar, and then to move it. In this direction. So you're moving the shaft toward you. I'm moving the shaft toward me. So now I'm I'm strengthening the walk of this. Very similar to bending a an iron. You're bending it the same direction you would. Don't this way with it. So by bending the shaft backwards, you're strengthening the wall. There we go, half a degree on it. Yeah. And then to weaken it, you're going to bring it toward you. Doing it in this direction. Obviously, uh, different putters have different components used to make them. What uh, what is something that you'd see that you wouldn't want to bend? Like, how do you know you're, you've got a putter that just doesn't want to bend, rather than putting it in two pieces? Um. Well, okay. Question like that. Of course, I'm going to come up with questions. If you're going to study. So well, this is one you brought, right? Yeah, so that's that Makefield I was talking about. <laughs> Let's see if I have one here. You don't want to bend. Well, so this one here, you don't want to bend. Okay. And the reason being is the shaft goes directly into the head. Now, when the shaft goes directly into the head, what you have to bend is the actual shaft. It's not impossible, but you don't want to break a double bend shaft because that has to go back to the manufacturer. You'll never get a shaft with the same, same bend to it. 
So to mount this in here, so this one's easier to bend, but it will show us the purpose of what we're trying to do. This one actually has a stem in it. Okay, so it's easy to bend this, but if I had to bend the shaft, I have a special bar. Now I'm going up here with it and I'm just bending the shaft. So it's not gonna bend, like I said, this one would bend, but I wouldn't bend this one this way because I have something to grab underneath the shaft there. So I would go in here with this. Now I could bend this part or this actually will bend really well because there's a stem that's running up the shaft. This one, there's no stem running up the shaft. The shaft's going directly into the head. So I have to bend this. And when you're bending this, you don't have much room. And I would tell you a lot of times I see that thing has a memory and that wants to go back. So it's hard to get it to hold. You might be able to move it two degrees, but two days it might go back to where it was. So that's the kind of one you want to avoid. You know, many times it's an expensive putter, you kind of want to avoid that one too. If you're not used to bending putters, not that you're ever going to break it because they're usually very soft, but you're going to, it's easy to mark it up. So once you, once you put a mark on it, you sort of- So if I see a hosel, that's going to be much easier to bend. If I don't see a hosel, the shaft that goes all the way through is very similar to the Callaway iron bore through, isn't it? Right. Okay. You know, a Callaway iron always bent very well. You could, you could adjust lying with that club very well. It was, it was actually very malleable. Um, Other shafts just, not too much. Well, again, when you, when you have to, you know, you're, you're talking about bending the, the actual head, right? With the bore through, so it was easy to bend the head. Right. When you have to bend just the shaft, this, this will break. I mean, when you're, when you're bending the shaft, it's easy to break it and it's hard to get it, like I said, to hold and stay. This was the um, kind of the putter you were talking about before. Right, that um, has that special breakthrough technology. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, um, you may be remembering Barney Adams, Adams Golf, right? So Adams Golf sold out, I think it was the TaylorMade. And so, Barney basically cleared out of the equipment business and um, went quiet for a couple of years, as so we thought. But what he was doing is he was creating this company called Breakthrough Technology. And Barney always believed that there was a market for good putter shafts because everybody was just using pretty much, you know, this, the same graphite or the same, you know, true temper steel shafts, correct, in putters. Mm -hmm. And so I think he, Barney was the first one to really come out with something different. And it's the Breakthrough Technology. And so we did this one. This is a, uh, a directed force, now known as LAB, Lie Angle Balance Putter, um, that you know some of us like and use. And this is a stability shaft here. And um, and what they did here is they have a sleeve, correct, Paul? Uh, this is so yes. Yeah, so this this is the sleeve. This goes over the top of this putter. And the bottom of the putter that you're holding in your left hand, that's the original shaft that came in that putter. And so what we did was we cut that off somewhere about eight inches from uh, the bottom here. And then this sleeve epoxies over the top of that. Right? And the reason I like this shaft is it, it kind of uh, muffles or deadens the hit. And I, so I get a much better feel with this particular shaft. Uh, I've liked it a lot so much so that I got a couple other putters here that I'm playing around with. And that company, Breakthrough Technology, has now a shaft which, if you want, you can take the shaft out of the head and insert their entire shaft right into your head, or you can do what I did here uh, with this particular uh, modified shaft and just cut your putter off here at eight inches and then slide this over, which is probably what we'll do because this shaft is uh, probably about $65, $70 less than their what they call their tour shaft, which goes all the way into the putter head, right? But again, it it gives a putter a much different feel. And uh, I think it's fun it was to play much around quieter. with. What's that? The hit was much quieter. Yes, it, it, it feels, the hit feels a lot dead to me. And so and that equates to feeling softer to me. The um, This was the one we were talking about before where to get this head out. Yes. You'd have to go down uh, I, I'd have to go down the shaft with your ramrod heated up. Well, you have to heat the rod and then heat it from the inside to get this out. I wouldn't want to be heating this head um, again, not knowing how how heat would damage. This. Yeah, because it's an anodized finish, and chances are, once we burn it, it's burned. Right, and 
so it's much easier if we just cut the shaft off. The performance of this shaft is no less than if you put it all the way into the putter head. Right? I have hit that shaft with other people's putters. It doesn't feel a lot different to have this partial shaft, which is again, $65, $70 less expensive at wholesale than the full shaft. But I think if, if you wanna give your, your putting sales a little different look, I think you try some different shafts because I, I, other than a putter head, uh, so like you say, if you take say two Odysseys or two Pings and have one with their steel shaft or fiberglass shaft, whatever you have in it uh, from the OEM, and then you know put that breakthrough technology, you know you might find it that's it's a nice little market for you because again, the thing I noticed at the show is putters are becoming quite expensive. Throw the shaft in there and you can make it any cheaper. Yeah, so I mean, you but know, it's you, nice to have on the putting green. Uh, yeah, most. Yeah, just yeah. to have floating around and let guys try it. And once they try it, I think you'll, you'll see that they'll, that's the only chance you're going to get them to use it. Yeah, right. It's a change of job. So. I know for for a number of years, Matt Dobbins was he was using the lab, you know, putting left handed as, as he's done for a number of years. So again, Matt, that, you know, that break tech. Breakthrough technology shaft might be fun for you to fool around with since you already have a putter like that. And then here's the uh, here's the make field that I was telling you about, Paul. So what you see here in the back of this putter are uh, little Allen screws that pop out, and then you have these what I call ports, right? And then you have different weights that you can put into the ports. But again, that's typical of the shaft that you would not try to bend. Um, so again, to look at this one, it's, there's a stem here. There's a slight stem. Yeah, so this is a sleeve. The shaft is a so sleeve. So when you say a stem, that thing. comes up into the bottom of my putter shaft? Yeah, it'll probably go up about this far. And then that, that piece will be very malleable and it'll be easy to adjust um, flat or upright, stronger, weak if you wanted to. So this would be, a, this would be one that would be okay to bend. And that's because it has a stem? Because it's a stem. Again, when you're bending just a shaft, it's harder to, um, to get that to move. And what, how often are you using this machine? Do you, do you well, see how does change a lot? I would say the, uh, most often is when somebody brings it in a putter or set of clubs to be regripped, many times I will look at it and be able to see that it has too much loft, not enough loft. Um, when you sole it, it doesn't sit square. And that's when I'll recognize that the loft is wrong or the uh, shaft angle is wrong or whatever. That's when I'll put it on the machine. Right. And then I'll say to somebody, look, you only have one degree of loft. You have no loft on this putter. Would you like to see what it looks like with three or four degrees of loft on it? Like it's supposed to have. And then to bend it like that, somebody will then put it down. People get used to seeing it a certain way. And they'll sit there and go, oh, my God, how did you do that? And, you know, from seeing it so many times, you know what it's supposed to look like. And then you change the way it sits. So you've technically made it square again. And then you've probably made it perform better as well because it's the way it was designed. Because now it fits the player better. Oh, now it fits the player better. I mean, it's funny. Like I said, it's funny how people will get used to it some way. You know, when I order a putter for myself, it's it's, it's a pain in the neck because the, again, if it's a double bend shaft, so many times it doesn't sole right for me, it doesn't sit right, and I'm always taking it apart, and resetting it so it sits the way I want it to sit. And it's not a question of the grip being crooked, it's the shaft being crooked. So, um, yeah. And so these putters like, like this one has a double bend in it, mm -hmm. right? So what's the purpose of a double bed in a putter shell? Well, different how it's going to set um, your, your offset. It'll set your eye line different. Um, yeah, I would venture to guess it has something to do with how this putter comes out face balance, although I don't know that for sure, but I would guess that double bend is allowing that to be face balance. You, you've got a little, you, this one goes this way. Right. And then you look at this one, many times these don't go in properly. And you can see the difference in how this has been. So you've got more offset here and less here. So the double bed's gonna help you with the look of the putter. And how it's you gonna probably, to probably aim one better than the other. Right, which is what I which is one of the things I want to do. Um, I purchased the upgrade for the Capto system. 
And now in the capital putting system, you know, that you can get a lot of different data from, there is a way to set up the capto on an aim line and you can calibrate the system to remember it. So I think that's going to be really effective for me when I'm giving putting lessons. Does it have do. sensors on the face? With that? The capto? Does it have it, it, No, it's just, no, it's not a sensor on the face. It's, it straps on here. Oh, there's okay. a little device here. Okay. And it, and what they've done, which I, I like, is there's a little window here as well on the capto, right? So that when I'm sitting there, you know, or, you know, standing there, the, uh, the capto sits like this and there's a window. So when I'm aiming, if I calibrate the putter to the aim line, which right. takes a few minutes, yes. but again, it's, it's well worth doing. And it's going to tell me if I'm aimed correctly, right? And so I, that's why I like that window. And then I can adjust the putter till I get to zero out, if you will. And then it's going to tell me that um, obviously aimed on my intended target line. And I think that's very effective because one of the things that I see a lot of you know, when I'm giving lessons is the putter's always twisted. And then people are making com compensations within the stroke to fix the bad aim at address. Most people seem to have the putter more closed and open, but don't realize it. And then they get used to looking at clothes like you were talking about. So I think anything you can do with T-lines or anything like that on a putting green, and again, fitting putters on a putting green is probably a good idea, mm -hmm. you know, to see how it performs for somebody. Any particular putters that you, you sell more of than others and, and any particular reason why? Mallets. Mallets, everybody's gone to mallets, right? So more mallets, I see, um, I'm starting to see a lot of players go back to blades though. So they're getting, seem to be a little more popular than they once were. But um, putters are a funny thing, guys hang on to them a long time. So you see somebody buy a Scotty Cameron putter, he's got that putter for 10, 15 years. Because a lot of times it's the last putter he's ever gone to. And, People also have a barrel full of putters in their basement, don't they? Which is why you're in business. But if they're all here and my basement. Yeah, it seems like uh, it seems like on the tours, both the Champions Tour, especially on the Champions Tour, and and the PGA Tour, it used to be everybody was blade, very few mallets, and mallets like we're not cool. And now mallets have have their place because you know a lot of people consider them more stable in the scoring area from four to twelve feet. One of the things we saw yesterday with putting from Mark Brody is that four to 12 foot range is where people score, right? right? Because that's your up and downs or that's your wonderful approach shots into the green. And if we have any more questions here for Paul before we wrap up, we'd be happy to, to answer them. All right, we'll just give this a the moment. If you have any questions, feel free to, to put them in. So in, in closing, I guess it, 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 it's the type of thing where you, you wanna go into whatever your repair shop now and do an inventory, right? Decide what tools you need, what you saw this morning. What, 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 what repairs you're gonna be interested in doing, right? Right, and have the and appropriate then, tools for that repair. And have the right tools for that job. Um, and then, um, you know, you, you're certainly gonna have to inventory yourself, right? I'm sure everybody knows what grips they want and, and how to inventory that. But as far as shafts goes, taper tip, parallel tip, uh, specific weights, I'm going to carry the shafts that I know I'm selling. You know, if I'm selling a, a lot of uh, say AMT shafts, I want to make sure I have some around for repairs. Right. So I'll, I'll inventory it that way. I know I'm going to um, sell an amount of Project X shafts and I'll make sure I have enough of those C tapers. I'm going to make sure I have enough of those. So that's, yeah, I'm inventorying it a lot of times out of repair. And then, you know, as far as building it, you know, building a set of irons, it's a couple day project anyway. I'll, a lot of times I'll order the sets. Right. And say, okay, I'll, I'll order it and, you know, have them in three days. But, right, right. And especially for the private clubs or uh, for those guys who are doing, and women who are doing minimal club repair, it's a lot easier to order the set from the company and have it in three to five days. So depending on the manufacturers, you're going to dictate the time frame that you're getting. Okay, Paul, what was the tool that took the grip off so easily? I use a big needle that sometimes shoots the solution in and wrecks the grip. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of the needle. 
Um, Though you like to give people the needle. No, I have a funny story about that next up. Um, with a guy years ago, and he had the needle, and he was showing me how to use it. And he went to inject it, and he injected it in his wrist. Oh. We were using gas. He shot it. His hand swelled up. And then he looked at me and he goes, I'm going to need a bigger glove. <laughs> he passed. <laughs> So I'm not a fan of the needle, but that is, um, if you go to Golf golf Works, it, it's on there. Um, I think they used to call it Ben's Wedge. I don't think they call it that anymore, but it's a, um, a grip removal tool. And it, like I said, if, if I had to save the grip, I would I would do it that way before any, any other way. I certainly wouldn't use the needle because I feel like I ruined it once I put a hole in it. Right. And then it, it's going to tear down the room. Plus, the when you room. widen that, you can put your solvent in there and loosen it. With, with the one I'm using? Yes. Yeah. So once you, you know, roll it back and then drop the um, uh, the wedge, you know, the, the grip removal tool down there and just drop some solvent and turn it. Some grips are going to take longer than others. Sometimes there's going to be some tape that builds up that stays on the grip on the inside of it. Um, I have another tool back there that. I would attach to a drill, fill the grip up with solvent, and drill it all out. Then it would come out. All the, get all the paper that's left on the grip off. All right, it's been very helpful. We appreciate your time. Always nice to have your expertise. Well, I hope I help help somebody. Well, you always help everybody. One of the things I enjoyed about this morning was a lot of times when I come up with these really good club repair ideas and I share them with you, you roll your eyes. And you haven't rolled your eyes once in the last two hours, so I appreciate that. It's very uncharacteristic. I know, I know. You're on your best behavior today, which, but again, that's with Noah in the camera here, you have to be. So uh, thank everybody. Here's my face. Thank everybody for coming on. I appreciate it. And again, on the 23rd, Thursday the 23rd, we're going to have Marty Jurchin and hopefully David Barmerkel from Ping on, and we'll see you then. Have a good weekend. Enjoy the weather. And it looks like people are going to be out playing your golf courses. Good day.